Hello everybody. Welcome to this, my video on the Argus C44. Let's see up here that. This is an interchangeable lens rangefinder camera with no light meter, shutter speeds of 1 10th to 1 300th of a second. That's on here uh, on this dial, which you can't really see because whoever used to own this put duct tape over it to uh, keep the dial from moving. And I have not yet been able to get the remnants of that adhesive off of the shutter speed dial. A little bit maddening, but that's life sometimes. And then the flash on this camera sinks at any shutter speed because it has a leaf shutter. Let's take this little filter out of here. We don't need it, and it is a little dirty. There we go, that's better. The Argus C44 was targeted at mid to upper range finder camera users. It has interchangeable lenses, though the interchanging on them is a bit wonky, and we'll go over that when we switch out the lenses. It does have very good build quality. I, I know Argus has a reputation as being a camera maker that had made like kind of toy grade cameras, except for the, the line, the C line, which mostly was bricks, big and heavy and impossible to destroy. But this camera, which looks good, also has really good build quality. The kit lens here, which is this has, was one of the first lenses ever designed on a computer. And it was designed on a computer at, I think it was MIT, I forget for sure. Th that was a big deal in the day, was a computer designed lens. However, most of the selling points of this camera, besides the lens design, and even though it was designed on a computer, it's kind of an eh lens. Um, most of the selling points, though, were cosmetic in the way that it looks and things like that. And this camera does have some significant flaws. So let's take a look at the first of these, which is kind of a big deal if you want to shoot slides or cine still film. The camera's pressure plate is chrome. Well, silver at any rate. It's not black. So when you have film in a camera, and you take a picture, the light's focused by the lens to be in focus on the film plane. The film does not absorb 100% of the light that reaches it. Some of it goes through the film and reaches the pressure plate. That's why pressure plates are black, so that they absorb as much of that light as possible when it makes it through the film. Well, Nero's makes no difference. That's a textured mirror. And what that means is that if you are using slide film or cine still film today, you will get, the texture will prevent you from getting ghost images coming back up, but it will give you some light scattering, which will give you some halation and reduction in uh, image quality and contrast in your slides and cine still film. So if you're gonna use this camera, it's best not to use those stocks and stick with some black and white or something like that. The lenses on this camera that were made for this camera, all of them are notoriously soft, meaning that they are not sharp, they don't focus light as well as comparable camera lenses or especially modern camera lenses. But the images that this camera is capable of delivering are not as well focused as they could be. And yes, the camera lenses can be changed, but the process for changing lenses is super, super fiddly, and it can be hard to get it exactly right, and it's definitely not something you should do with if you're on a footbridge or near a cliff, because it's very easy to uh, get distracted by it or to drop them, because it is a bit of a process. And this also has a shockingly loud leaf shutter. And by leaf shutter standards, that is like a cannon shot. So these were made by Argus cameras in Ann Arbor, Michigan from 1956 to 1957. It was preceded by the C4 concurrent with the C20 and Super 75 and followed by the C44R. So if you have your Argus C44, let's take a look at what the different features and functions are. Now you'll notice it has no strap lugs. That's because this was designed to be used with a case that would have a strap in it. But over here on this side, we have the film rewind right here. The film plane indicator right here. This is for taking measurements for doing things like microscopy. Flash hot shoe. That is an actual hot shoe. You can see the electronic contact in the center. 
frame counter, shutter release, and film advance knob here. I love how when you advance the film, the shutter button pops back up. And then the frame counter just needs to be manually reset when you load a new roll of film, and we'll see how to do that later in the video. On the front of the camera, we have the shutter speed dial, the lens, aperture ring, this is your focus. This is paired with the range finder so that when you focus, your range finder will tell you what is properly in focus. This is your range finder window. This is your viewfinder window. So what happens is when you look at a scene, light comes in through both of these windows. Light from this window comes here to a mirror and bounces over here to a pellicle mirror. And so it creates a ghost image in the viewfinder window and you focus by aligning the images within that little area. And when they are aligned on the thing that you want to have be in focus, then you know that you've achieved proper focus and that's how this works. It's a very good system. Range finders were very advanced in terms of their accuracy in uh, focusing. On the camera's back, we have the viewfinder window here and your flash selection socket, uh, switch rather. So X is modern flashes, M is bulb flashes. You're not gonna be using an M bulb flash in all probability. So if you'd want to use a flash with this camera, just leave it set to X. Where's the PC port? Oh, that's right, <laughs> it has a hot shoe, so there's no PC port. So at any rate, what the switch does is this just affects timing. M uh, bulbs would take a second to illuminate and get up to full brightness. Xenon or X flashes were, have a capacitor that discharges into a xenon bulb so that it goes from nothing to super bright effectively instantly. And so if you use a modern flash when you're set to M, your shutter speed and flash sync timing will not be correct. So any flash you can buy today is an X flash. So just set it to this and your shutter timing will be correct. On the bottom, we have the tripod socket right here, and then the film back release right here. And uh, then on the camera's inside, we have the film cassette chamber right here, which is where you'll put a new roll of film, some guide rails, the shutter box, the film tension sprocket, the film take up spool right here, which is what takes up your film as you advance it. And then on the back, we have the film pressure plate. Uh, let's see, it goes, so, we'll, so you can see the film pressure plate lines up here to put pressure on the film against the guide rails and that keeps the film flat so that what comes through the lens is properly focused on the film plane. Now, since we have the camera open, let's load film and see how that works. We're gonna take a roll of 35 millimeter film, gonna pull out a liter, gonna advance the film take up spool until we can see this little bar here. Oops. Then we're going to feed the leader underneath it. Come on. And advance the film. There we go. Once that's advanced, next we're going to put the film back on. Just always harder than it should be. There we go. And now, we're gonna look to see if this counts up or down, because I can't remember, I think it counts up. But we're going to advance three frames. And it counts down, ooh. We're gonna advance the three frames, and now we have a 24 exposure roll of film in here. So we're gonna push down on the frame counter and rotate it until we get now to 24 and we're set to go. That's it, the film is loaded. So we're gonna take our pictures as we go through our roll of film. I'm telling you, by the time I finish this video, my hand is gonna be just beefcake strong. Okay, and every time we take a picture, we just advance and then and that's how the uh, film goes through the camera. Now film is one and done, so don't open your film back until you've gone through your roll of film and rewound it. But I want you to see what happens in here when you take a picture. 
We're going to take a picture. We're going to assume that all of your settings are correct. Push the shutter button. And now as you advance the film, it's taken out of the cassette, pulled across the back of the camera, and taken up on the take-up spool. Now typically, to rewind the film, we have a film rewind button on the bottom of the camera. This camera does not have that. So in order to rewind your film, you lift up on the film rewind knob, rotate it slightly, and then now that disengages the advance so that you can rewind the film, which you would do after you finish your entire roll, but before you take the back off of the camera. If you take the back off of the camera when you, are, when you have the film in it, you will ruin all of your film. And there we go. So once you've rewound your film, you'd rewind it so that the leader is entirely inside of your film. Take off the film back, pop out your cassette, grab another one if you're going to keep shooting, and then reload. Or if you're not, just make sure, oops, just make sure to activate your shutter before you put your camera away for the night. Put the film back, back on. Lock it in place, and you're good to go. So the next thing we're gonna do is talk about how to meter with this camera because it doesn't have a built-in light meter. What you wanna do is either use the Sunny 16 rule or a handheld meter, or if you have a smartphone, you can get a metering app, and those are pretty accurate. Accurate to uh, within the tolerance of the film for sure. So if you're gonna use the Sunny 16 rule, what that means is your film speed and your aperture should be the name of the rule. So let's say it's sunny outside, you're outside and you have the sun to your back. At f16, your shutter speed should be the, the, the number nearest your film speed. So this goes up to 1 300th of a second, which would mean 400 speed film on a sunny day is the fastest you're gonna be able to use. But if you had 100 ISO film in here, then you would set it to, I can't read the shutter speeds because of this duct tape goo, but it's either 1 100th or 1 1 25th. And you would just set it to that, to that shutter speed. That's 1 25th it looks like right now. So if you were using 20 ISO film on a sunny day, you could use F16 at 1 1 25th. You could also use F8, let's say, at 1 100th, or F4 at 1 300th. Shaded 8, uh, Indoor 4 or Indoor 2 8, things like that. Those are other guides you can use uh, to get a proper exposure with this camera without a light meter. Um, if you're using a light meter, a, a, a handheld or smartphone, it will tell you for your film speed what the shutter speed and aperture combination should be. This has a you can set the aperture to intermittent between f8 and 11, between f4 and f5.6 to get things like f4.5 or f6.3 or f9 uh, if you need to do that as well. You don't have to set it on a click stop and only use those. Next thing let's do is change the lens. This is a bit fiddly. So what we're gonna do, come on, there we go is we're gonna, we have to adjust the focus until we're aligned correctly, which is, well, you can see it with the um, lens off right here, but it's about like that. And then you push this button up and you can remove the lens from the, uh, from the mount. There's a little notch here, and over on this side there's a little dealy right there, and those line up. So to mount the lenses, you need to have these two red dots lined up. And we're gonna find this red dot here. This red dot also lines up with those. But realistically, there's only one way to put this in. And then once it's in, you just turn this and that should stay in, but it doesn't because this is fiddly. So let's try that again. There we go, that seems to be in this time. But it took me two tries, which it, nope, it's not in this time. <laughs> ah, goodness. Oh, that's right, that's because this goes up to lock the lens in place. I had it unlocked this whole time. Okay, let's try this again. So you can see there's also a little notch right there in the lens, that lines up with the notch right there in the mount. So we're gonna get that in place. 
that in place. We're going to push this up. Why isn't that staying in place? Well, it's working now. Okay. No, it's not. <sighs> the other thing you should not do is buy one of these if you have anger management issues. Did we do it? Here we got it. Okay. What happened was I was not getting the uh, notches aligned correctly when I was trying to get this loaded. So it is, like I said, a very, very fiddly system and perhaps not the most well designed in the history of camera manufacture. Next thing we're going to do is talk about how to use these, the focusing scale on top of the camera lens. Okay. So on top of the camera lens, we have these, this scale that goes from, the, the triangle is your focus point, and then these numbers moving outward from it are correspond with your main aperture numbers here on the aperture ring. This is your focusing scale. So this is gonna give you a couple of different data points. Let's say that we're going to focus at F8. We're gonna use F8 as our aperture. We want to focus at eight feet because that's where our subject is standing. They're eight feet away from us. At f8, everything from about 5 feet to about 15 feet will be in focus. That's what this scale is telling us. Where the aperture numbers align, everything between those two with your selected aperture is going to be in focus. If it was a really sunny day and we had to use f16, everything from just shy of 5 feet to about 50 feet would be in focus. If it was a cloudy day and you had to use f4, or let's say f2.8 because that's actually marked, everything from about just shy of 8 feet to just shy of 10 feet would be in focus. So the scales here will tell you what is going to be in focus from your selected focus point based on your aperture. It will also help you figure out your hyperfocal setting. So if you wanted to set it at f22 and just be able to have everything in from Near, near your lens to the beginning of time in focus, what you would do is find the infinity focus mark and line it up with the 22 here. And then you would know that everything from just shy of four feet, probably about three and three quarters feet, to infinity focus is going to be in focus at F22. If F22 isn't going to work and you want to use F16, then you just stop it back to F16 and we know everything from 5 feet to infinity is going to be in focus there. So these scales will tell you what's in focus with your given aperture and also help you set an optimum focus distance if you don't want to have to worry about fine-tuning your focus for every shot. Okay, the last thing we're going to do is talk about how to take a picture with this camera. And it's a pretty straightforward process. What we're going to start with is assuming that you have your meter reading and your shutter speed and aperture set correctly. Okay, so we're going to set it to f4 and uh, again, that's not going to work. Let's call that, that's probably about 1 300th right there. Let's pretend that f4 and 1 300th are going to work for your proper exposure. You want to make sure that your film is advanced and your shutter is ready to fire. You're going to look through your viewfinder window here and you're going to focus until you get your subject in focus. And let's say, okay, that looks good. They're, your subject's five feet away and the two images have overlapped and now are in focus. So you know you're ready to go. Then you just take your picture and as soon as you finish that, you just advance. And that's the process for taking a photo with the Argus C44. It's really very simple, very user-friendly, and very quick to do. So some things not to do with your Argus C44 other than using duct tape to hold the shutter dial in place. Do not store the camera with the shutter ready to fire. When you're done for the day, trigger the shutter. Even if you have a roll of film in there and you plan to come back to it in a day or two, the mechanical components of this shutter are all spring operated and if they're stored with tension on them, they will over time start to develop that memory. So it is cheaper to trigger your shutter and ruin a single frame of film than it is to have the shutter repaired on this if storing it 
with tension on the shutter causes it to fail. Don't touch the shutter when you have the lens off. That's a really good way to brick your shutter. Uh, don't leave your camera and lenses in your car because the heat can cause the oils in it to get very thin and get to places they shouldn't be. The cold can also cause them to get really uh, thick and break down and then they turn gummy. Both of those situations cause the camera not to work properly. Also, it's a really good way to come back to a broken window and no camera. Don't store your camera in a plastic bag or box unless you have a rechargeable desiccant pack because moisture permeates plastic and it can get onto your lens and into your leather and it can make your camera smell bad or impair your image quality. Don't let your camera get wet because the components inside of this camera will rust and then it will not function possibly at all. So keep this uh, from getting wet when you use it. And just remember your Argus C44 is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. All right, and that is it for my video on the Argus C44.